I'm Krista Lewis, and sometimes I'm Pippa Jane, and you're listening to the Featured Voice with Jacques, an audio flow podcast series, because these voices deserve to be heard. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the Featured Voice. I can't believe we're at the final episode for season two. And I really hope that you've enjoyed it just as much as I have. I mean, narrators are just so funny to me. And um, I always like listening to their stories about the um, what is the appropriate attire in the booth and all of the uh, funny blunders that they've had. And it's just so fun to get to know them on a different level outside of, you know, just how long they've been narrating and things like that. So um, I like it to be personable and it's been amazing. This week, as we end season two, um, I have a little story. I, I met this person through another Facebook group. She was doing a live chat and um, and she had the best personality full of life, so much fun, um, even volunteered to record, do some uh, voice recordings for people's, um, I was about to say answer machine, how old am I, um, voicemail for their cell phones or whatever. And she uh, took on that task and messaged it out to people. And I thought that was so cool. And I just had to have her on the featured voice and she agreed. And not only that, She also agreed to do the intro for the featured voice for season two. So, yes, I have Krista G. Lewis, also known as Pippa Jane, here with me today, ready to chat it up. So please help me welcome this week's featured voice guest, Krista G. Lewis. Good morning, Krista. How are you? Good morning, Jacques. I'm great. I'm really looking forward to this. I'm excited about having you uh, and actually season two of the Featured Voice. I can't believe we've made it this far. And I'm excited that you're the one that's that's ending everything. And thank you. Thank you so much for actually being the voice of the intro of this season's um, show. So thank you very much. I am absolutely thrilled. I cannot wait to hear it live. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and also um, n- maybe next time I'll have you do uh, I'll have you do the intro in German. Ooh, cool! All right. <laughs> Nobody would know what they're listening to. They'll be like, "I have no idea what this show is," but it sounds really cool. <laughs> maybe we could try to get a bunch of languages. I mean, everybody speaks. Something one some narrator will speak maybe Russian or French. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be fun. You know, if I ever decide to do a series based on dialect and the uh-huh. fun things and the resources and the way people have um been able to utilize those those accents, then I'll do an intro and everybody will just put in a, a different accent for the audio flow. So I'm telling you, there are stories to be told. There are accent nightmares and accent delights. Trust me. <laughs> I just came out of learning Cajun for oh a book. Oh, gosh. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And even the man who I was listening to called it a broken language because Cajun is so complicated for a non-Cajun speaker or mm-hmm. somebody without the accent that even if you're doing it right, you sound wrong to yourself. Mm-hmm very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So let's let's kind of talk a little bit about your journey. I know I've I had a little information from you before um when you did an interview in one of the audio groups, but for new listeners who aren't familiar with your work, we'd love to know how you kind of transitioned into audiobook narration. I know for some people they kind of Uh, find it by accident or they kind of stumble into it or they've done some type of acting and maybe somebody suggested it to them so what's your journey been like getting to the point where now this is this is uh more so of your career yeah well it is true it is my career I do narrate audiobooks full-time I'm really um blessed I got picked up by traditional publishers in 2014. And since then, um, more and more clients have been interested in my work. And 
I was able to win um, some earphones awards. So it's been it's been a really strong, short time since I started. I started in 2012, and how I got into it was kind of an accident. I um, had been working as a newsreader for an international news broadcaster in Berlin, Germany. I was working in English for television news um, as a voice. And I came to L.A. on a holiday to visit my dad. And I was having just a lot of fun. And my dad, just as a goodbye gift, because I was leaving in a couple of weeks back to Germany, he signed me up for a voiceover class. And I had been working with my voice since 1995. And um, <laughs> But I had always been doing kind of the same thing. I had been doing either news or narrating documentaries for this news station. I had done their promos and their station voice kind of stuff. And so I was having a blast. I was in LA and I was having all this fun and I was chattering on and on about this with my boyfriend. And he said, huh, sounds like you kind of want to stay. And honest to Pete, it had never occurred to me that <laughs> I was going <laughs> I don't know how careful I have to be. So, no, you're no, fine. No, no. so I, um, I, I, I just didn't say no. And everything changed. I called a dear girlfriend. She went to my apartment in Berlin. She boxed up my life. She sent it to me in LA. I lived in my dad's guest room for eight months. And I assumed naively and perhaps arrogantly that I would immediately somehow make work happen with my voice because A, it's all I knew how to do. And B, I had been quite successful in Europe. I had done all sorts of things, audio guides, animation. I had my full-time job at the news station. So I kind of thought, well, maybe I have to make changes in what I do to make it here in commercial, but it should be fine. And it turned out that because of my practice, you know, we had these eight hour shifts at the news station. So I was really used to doing long hours at the microphone. Mm -hmm. And I was very practiced as a reader, you know, because sometimes you had to do the news without prep. You, you couldn't prepare at all. It was just it was going on air and you had to just read it like it made sense. So myself and all my colleagues at Deutsche Welle Television, we're all really efficient good readers you know we just we just get in there and we do our job so anyway so I had a client calling in from Berlin they needed me to record something and I called around town I was looking for a studio and this woman on the other end of the phone started jumping up and down it felt like and shouting at me do you do audiobooks do you do I had been here for like seven days like I had just decided to stay and I was sort of trying to figure out what I, what to do and how to get work here and and I said, not yet, but I'd like to. I had never listened to an audiobook in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just like, how hard could it be? So um, she said, you must call my husband. And so I did. And it turned out he ran Bob Dion. Um, it's arguably the largest independent publisher of audiobooks, uh, for sure, in California. Mm -hmm. And he auditioned me like the next day and put me on their roster. And I began to understand very quickly as I was trying to figure out what it was like to live in America after 20 years absence and how to get work in this town, which, by the way, is the toughest market maybe on the planet for voice actors, um, that I had some learning to do because my newsread didn't work for commercials or um, radio and the experience I had, I did promo and station voice, which is like, you know, coming up in 90 minutes, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So that stuff, even that, because it was in Europe, it was a completely different thing than what they did. So I started to go into class, but the audiobook thing stuck. So I did a weekend, I did my demo and my demo immediately created interest. So whatever I could do, the skills I needed as a newsreader were very easily translatable to doing audiobooks, it turns out. And the how hard can it be? Well, I learned very quickly. <laughs> my first book. Okay, so my first book was 90 Minutes Nonfiction. And I was like, oh, 
piece of cake. I go in to a studio. I find a studio because I didn't have my home recording set up at the time. Mm -hmm. And that was years before bedtime. I had to teach myself how to record. I was horrified. This was too hard. So I booked a studio. I go in. It takes me three hours to record 90 minutes of audio, which for me is ridiculous, too long. And then I come home and it took me 100 hours to figure out how to edit that book. I'm not kidding. Two weeks into the edit, I realized I'd made a huge mistake and I had to throw out the whole edit and start from scratch. That was sorry. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. But as I was doing all that and, you know, weeping into my laptop, um, because it was just, it was just, my brain just wasn't configured to all the software and equalizing and I was so used to engineers making me sound good and I felt like I sounded horrible and it was a very humbling, very long, it took me 18 months essentially. So that's the upshot of it. So 18 months later, I was recording at a good pace. I knew how to edit my books. I knew how to master them, which is tweak the sound or process the sound. So you sound um, as good as you want to sound Mm -hmm. and I, upload to the internet. And I had also in that time that I was teaching myself all these things and starting to book books and not booking commercial voiceover. Um, I was training constantly. I, I went to every class in LA. I studied with as many teachers as I could find. And my read began to shift and I became, I became kind of current for this, you know, for this market. Um, but the audiobook started to to really pick up. And I guess I caught the bug or I also realized, I mean, I had done the news for 18 years. So I was used to being a full-time employee. So I was looking for full-time work. Do you know what I mean? I was, yeah. I wasn't really a freelancer in my brain. And I, I think I just kind of realized that audiobooks are long-term and they suit me. I'm as hard as it's been. And it has been, I call narrating audiobooks pushing a car up a hill with your brain. <laughs> really, that's what it's been. Every single book has been a challenge, a learning event. There's always been something where I've been stumped or stymied and I've had to just kind of learn it and muscle through, but it suits me because I'm a I love to learn new things. Yeah. I've always been kind of geeky like that. And now that I'm getting, I mean, I've been, I've been blessed with some extraordinary books. I've met some one, I, I have one author. I love her to bits. I've met really beautiful people. And so it kind of worked out as hard as it was to get to here today. Mm-hmm. It was probably where I should have been all along somehow. I mean, I had the actor training, so I had to dust all that off when I got to LA. I was like, oh my gosh, I haven't done any acting in years. So I, you know, I took an improv class and I hadn't done any real voice work in a million years. So I did a voice class. I just, I kind of dusted off all those things that I had done before I left for Germany in 95, 94. And I just kind of reactivated the skills and it's working out and I'm blessed really. Yeah. And so, so before you went to Germany, uh, pre 1995, which, Hey, that was a good year. It's the year I graduated high school. Um, (laughs) I just told everybody my age, but anyway, so before you, before you went to Germany, what are some of those things you were doing as far as with your acting and your voiceover skills? Were you doing any, you know, um, stage plays or anything like that? Something I should go and, and try to look up and see if I can find you in a commercial or, you know, (laughs) <laughs> no, because I just, when you were graduating high school, I had just graduated college. I had just graduated from Boston University College of Fine Arts, or I can't remember. It was called either School for the Arts or College of Fine Arts back in the day. It has since changed its name. I was a theater major. And I literally, a couple months after graduation, 
went on holiday. There's a theme developing here. I went on holiday to Germany and ended up staying. (laughs) So my first voiceover jobs were actually in Germany. I ended up getting a job as a prop girl on Phantom of the Opera in Hamburg, Germany. And a couple years later, I moved to Berlin and I worked on another musical there as a uh, uh, in the office admin and stuff. And then, and I, but I always tried to do voiceover work. Some, I ended up doing cartoons in Europe, audio guides. Um, I got crazy jobs. I ended up on an exhibit that went to MoMA in New York, but I was cast in Berlin. So it's been, I guess, you know, the only limitations you, you can't even think about things being local anymore it's it's all kind of a big global salad right and um and some of those cartoons were then shown here in the states like altair i think went to disney channel years ago though and the school for little vampires which we did like four or five seasons also a cartoon that we did in journey um in english and in german i only did the english version i'm not sure where that got shown It might have ended up just on DVD in Europe, but that was a great little cartoon. And uh, there was my voice, you know, going around the world every day. And the annoying part about that is I would go home because I have a lot of family in Germany. So I'd go visit them and they'd be like, what is it you do again? (laughs) Um, My voice is on TV going around the planet every day. And they'd look at me and they'd be kind of confused. And I'd be like, never mind. (laughs) I hear those stories all the time. When um, when narrators, voiceover um, performers and their family or friends or someone asks, what is it you do again? And yeah. the horror stories that you guys tell about trying to explain what it is you do. And then I've seen some people that just don't say anything. Uh, <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so bad that people don't. You know what's so funny? Um, once I started this podcast and once I really got into listening to audiobooks and things, I listen to everything differently. Now I'm yeah. listening to a commercial and I'm like, I wonder if I know that person because I probably could know that person that's doing that commercial or, um, when we're listening to the radio and a jingle comes on or the intro or something comes on, I'm like, that sounds like such and such. I wonder if they did that. And so it makes it more relatable. And I think that when people don't really look at that and just say, oh, this person narrates audiobooks. No, they do voiceover, which means they probably do narrate audiobooks, but they also are using their voice for other things like cartoons. I would have never, you know, I look at cartoons and I'm like, oh, I know that person. I know who narrated that car. I know that voiceover. And it's just so much different. So I think if we try to explain it to people that's more relatable, especially if they're not really into audiobooks, they'll never get it. But if you say, hey, did you listen to that aspirin commercial? Yeah, that was me. You know, (laughs) because you take a talent off. Absolutely. Absolutely. Out here in L.A., it's totally typical L.A., but there's a a courtyard, there's a pool in the courtyard with um, a hot tub. And so one of my neighbors, it turns out, is he's a a gamer. He plays video games, like, Mm -hmm. obsessively. And I was just like, yeah, I'm in this video game. And he said, which one? I said, (laughs) oh, Call of Duty. And he, like, he paled. He got pale (laughs) in the hot tub. He said, which Call of Duty? I said, well, Black Ops 3, you know, the one with Malcolm McDowell. And he said, who are you in that (laughs) video game? I said, I'm Sophia. I'm the snippy German Nazi artificial intelligence, the one that's always um, uh, cutting down the player. You know, couldn't you do that better? (laughs) (laughs) And he flipped out. He was like, you are not in Call of Duty. And I said, yeah, I am. Really, I am. And um, so he went and he looked and we looked at it on YouTube and it was really hilarious. But I love doing video games. And I feel like doing audiobooks is really good practice for all that that stuff. So, so yes, and I also, I listen to everything differently now because now I also teach because I trained. I trained nonstop since the day I got here. And 
So now I teach because I taught myself what I needed to be listening for. Mm -hmm. And now I work with other people and we, you know, we, we, to share that. And, um, it does my boyfriend, even my German boyfriend, he can't listen to anything normally either because (laughs) now that he's been with me for so long, he's like, did you hear that? (laughs) (laughs) What did you hear? He's like, they just did not say that right. I was like, Absolutely. (laughs) I don't know if that makes us good or bad. It's kind of like if you're a book editor, you can't really read the book for leisure anymore because you're always in edit mode. And it's the same now that, you know, you're kind of into the, you know, voiceover narration and, you know, enunciation and and dialect and dictation. And now when you listen to, to things, you're like... Oh, they shouldn't have put that twang on there. Oh, where did where did they think they were going? And how you mentioned earlier about the Cajun accents, and you know, you know, you're listening to that, and you're like, oh, that draw was just a little too much. They put a little too much French in it, or not enough French, and and so it's like, when do we not do that? Is it hard? Do you think it's hard to separate? You know, just being able to listen to things for leisure versus, and I won't say critiquing because I don't think it's critiquing it's more just again we've got that extra listening cap on um do you find that hard especially if you're like reading and listening to an audiobook you know just for leisure are you picking up on things or are you just really enjoying it both actually (laughs) I think the days are over when I could just like sit back and because I'm also trying to learn Mm -hmm. like if the narrator is brilliant Mm -hmm. then I'm also, I'm listening and I'm enjoying the story, right? And I'm enjoying how beautifully they're um, telling the story or how beautifully they're fulfilling the characters. But another part of my brain is also absorbing it so that I could one day maybe use some of the things they're doing, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's gone now. A girlfriend of mine, we listen to each other's work. She's listened to a lot more than I have listened to hers, but because we were giving each other notes at times. And, but sometimes she was just so great that I would be laughing out loud on the bus, making a complete fool of myself. And that's my favorite moment when it's, when the narrator is so good that they they go away and the story is just alive in my head. That's my favorite time. That's what I love the most. Yeah. So do you have certain genres that you enjoy just kind of listening to during your leisure time? I don't have any leisure time. I'm an <laughs> audio narrator. Aww, that's so sad. I always you, Okay, so that that kind of goes back to do you do you enjoy weekends and people are like what's a weekend? Like we still work on weekends. <laughs> what's a weekend? So um If I were to pick one, you know, I like, I'm not fussy. I love great storytellers. I do try to avoid stories where they're super dark or I call them fun with forensics. Like I'm really bad at stuff like CSI, you know, those kind of stories where it's really blood and gore and guts because it's just, I'm a little bit of a sensitive sensitive thing. So I like, I like it a little funny. I like mystery. I like it when it's a little sexy sometimes. I mean, and it's, it's a, if it's a good story and a good narrator, I'm in, you know, I'm not, I'm delighted. And some children's books, holy moly. Some of them are so clever and so awesome. I listen to those too. Have you narrated any children's books? I got to narrate one audition of a children's book once that actually broke me into traditional publishing. My dear friend, Marty Dumas wrote Jaden Toussaint, the greatest shameless plug for probably the best children's book ever written ever in the history of ever. The whole series is wonderful. And I auditioned for it because I was so in love with the story and she really wanted a male narrator But she let me audition and she loved the audition. And I realized that I had grown so much as a narrator that I used that audition. And that's what got me into my first, um, like, you know, big book, Infinite Home. That that audition 
broke me into the traditional audiobook publishing company, company, Blackstone. Do you think there's something different about narrating children's stories or books versus, um, you know, make YA fantasy, you know, mystery? What is it about those books you think, um, I guess, kind of, I might answer the question for you, so I'm just going to stop. So <laughs> what is it do you think is about those children's stories that kind of um, allow narrators or yourself included to be expressive or you think makes for a good demo? Maybe that's the, the route I should go with that question. So I think we as audiobook narrators, I think we draw on the same tools, no matter what the genre. Mm -hmm. But one of the tools you use is you ask yourself, who is my listener? What's the demographic? So for a children's book, as opposed to YA, right, you, you give yourself an age range. Mm -hmm. And the minute you start talking to a three-year-old, you change vocally, as opposed to talking to a 14-year-old, right? We completely change, all of us do. It's just natural. We just do it. So the minute you know you're starting to talk to a three-year-old, you begin to engage in that really bright part of your voice that kind of is right up in front of your face, right up in the mask, because it's brighter and really lively. And you know you have to keep these kids' attention, and their attention spans are shorter. And you have to, you really have to pull out all the stops. You have to give all your vocal bells and whistles to keep them with you. And so you kind of automatically, or I automatically get a little brighter and a little bit more focused in the front of my face because I'm already thinking I'm talking to little kids. Yeah. With YA, I think it's more, it's always tone. So that's the answer to your question. I think at the bottom, to really answer the question, I think with all those different genres, it's the narrator accessing the mood created by the author's words and understanding who's going to be listening to this story mm -hmm. and using those two barometers. That's how you start to embody the words with your voice. Yeah. And I would um, like to know, so in case you all didn't know, Krista also has a pseudonym that she narrates under and it's Pippa Pippa Jane, right? Pippa, Pippa Jane. Jane. And so with with that being said, um, what do you find, I guess, more exciting? Uh, narrating kind of those, you know, books under Krista? <laughs> or right. books where you can, or books where you can kind of uh, enjoy being Pippa for a little bit. Which one kind of, you know, get your, get your heart, pumping a little bit faster um well it is true i mean pippa has some serious smexy encounters i will say <laughs> she's had some spicy experiences <laughs> and um so that's always fun um because hey i'm in that booth all by myself yeah. all day long and my boyfriend is in germany so <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> we talk via Skype. So every now and then I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going to steam up the booth then. <laughs> so, um, and also there's, I think, I don't know about any other narrators, but one or two I have spoken to, for them they feel similarly that when you narrate under a pseudonym, it's like putting a mask on. You're just a tiny bit more free. I don't know why. It's just, it, there's a, there's behind the anonymity, maybe I'm a bit more daring in my choices vocally, or maybe it's because of the material. It's already kind of, you know, erotic or romantic or, um, you know, sweet or super sexy. And so, I just let my voice go and I get a little, I notice I get a little deeper. I go a little deeper in my register and I just get a little bit more comfortable and chilled out. I think I'm more relaxed actually. So they can be really fun books to narrate. It sounds like it. And, and besides the fact, of course, if a lot of people don't know that you and Pippa are one and the same, again, right. you kind of just, kind of just go there and you, 
you can use the same a phrase that my mom and I use and say, uh, I don't know those people. <laughs> so <it's- laughs> That's right. That's right. I don't know her. Exactly. <laughs> it's kind of the thing that we, we say when we go on vacation and we just kind of do our thing. We don't know these people. We'll never see them again. So it really doesn't matter what kind of happens right now. And so with you in that booth and you're just, you know, um, you're recording to the audience, which of course is, is the listeners and, um, and your boyfriend is in Germany. So do you ever kind of put on the Pippa Jane hat and, um, you know, send him a couple samples? I mean, that might be too much, but do you just put on the Pippa Jane hat? I just want to know, do you get all Pippa Jane, you know, when you guys have your Skype conversation? (laughs) So I tried once. I had just finished my first <laughs> 17 and a half hour um, Brie Learns the Art of Submission, which is a hilariously funny, incredibly sexy book. And we're Skyping. I had just finished this book and I look at him and he looks at me on the Skype and I'm like, you know, and he went, what? I said, well, I'm just saying. And he was like, What? <laughs> And he started to get really nervous. I said, well, I don't know. I'm just saying, I mean, I've learned a lot. (laughs) And he he went, and I'm going to bleep myself. And he went, oh, oh, no, you don't know. I am too old for that. Beep. (laughs) So, yeah. So that was kind of the extent of me putting on my Pippa Jane hat. (laughs) That was was the first and the last. And it just ended right there, huh? It kind of ended right there. <laughs> oh, that's that's a bummer. <laughs> but, you know, I can't blame him. I mean, he wasn't in the booth for me for those 18 hours of wild, wild, funny, fun, sexy experiences. So, and it turns out he's a World War II buff. So the books that he likes to listen to are, you know, history and tanks and Germany and all that World War II stuff. So recently he's been listening to this one about that I also did. It was a 33-hour book on the concentration camp uh, Ravensbrück, which was a concentration camp built specifically for women. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you cannot listen to this book. It's too sad. Mm -hmm. But he's been muscling through it and... I would send him a Pippa Jane any day, but he's not having it. It's like, no, no, I've got World War II, Stalingrad, and the tanks. I'm good. (laughs) I think it would just be so funny to hear, to hear, for him to hear you put on like the Dom submission and, you know. (laughs) I love my sexy Russian Dom. I love Reitzar. Oh. I, I don't think know. That would be so fun. You tell him that I said he doesn't know what he's missing. He's... Thank you. <laughs> I will. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about you know what you've been working on recently? I know yeah. you've pretty had, had a busy year. I have. I have been. Um, I've been really fortunate, and I mean, my fortune not for other people's horrible misfortune, but um, they just recently, I just finished um, a book called The Floating World for Tantor. And um, this book is about the aftermath of Katrina. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously, it's a fiction book and it's set against the backdrop of a very mysterious occurrence, but it really takes one slice of one family's experience. And the author did experience Katrina. So this was her way of processing her loss, really. Um, And it's very moving. It's it's, It's a difficult book because the topic is difficult. You come out of it, I think you feel like you've experienced a slice of the loss. You know, people lost their whole world. And I, having just literally, I just uploaded that book, uh, 10 days ago, the last chapters to the, uh, the, my client and, you know, watching them, the pictures of, of Harvey in Texas. And so it's very present. Um, and then I got to do a book called, uh, 
the Gypsy Moth Summer. And, you know, I learned so much from these books. It's a work of fiction. But did you know that the northeast coast of America is ravaged by a plague of gypsy moths through the states of Rhode Island, Connecticut, Vermont, and Maine every couple of years? This gypsy moth and they, the caterpillars deforest and defoliate like hundreds and hundreds of acres of trees. So the author used that as the backdrop for her story. And um, so that one just, I, I finished that one right before The Floating World. And the one I'm working on right now is a romance. Uh, it's a Pippa. Pippa is working on a book, uh, a hockey romance, which is really, really, really super cool. It's, um, it's very funny. And it's, my favorite thing about it, you know, it's women in the world of hockey, which, right, that's totally unheard of. Right. So the head of the hockey team, um, sort of the patriarch, before the book starts, so I'm not giving anything away, before the book starts, he passes away. And in the will, he leaves the team to his extremely competent daughter, but he requires that she share ownership of the team with her two estranged half-sisters and if she doesn't make it to the, I think the playoffs within one season, and they're like the bad news bears, they're the worst team in the league right now. So if she doesn't make it to the playoffs within one season, he's obviously setting her up to fail. And if she doesn't make it to the playoffs within the, by the end of the season, that's it. The team gets sold. She's out of hockey and hockey is her life. Yeah. And yeah, it's really, really fun. So Right now, that's what I'm doing. And the player, of course, that she falls for at some point is comes from that part of Louisiana, New Orleans, from the Cajun part. <laughs> it's so oh, great. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and, you know, this author, God bless the author, she found her hockey players are Swedish, Cajun, uh, Texan, and who else? Who was the other one? A Swede, a Cajun, a Texan, and... There's not a, a normal American accent. Of course not. In the bunch. It's, it's everywhere. Of course not. It's just so funny. And then we're going to do a sample of the floating world. But it's so funny now that when I read, you know, when, as a reader, you read a person has, oh, he has an Aussie accent or he's got this, you know, French accent. And in our head, you know, we've got this, we've, we've given them this you know, generic accent in our head. But then when the book goes to audio, it's like now I'm saying, gosh, I really feel bad for that narrator who's going to have to come up with that accent, especially if it's some accent. Of course, like everybody tells me that um, Scottish is one of the hardest ones that Scottish and like Danish, I think. And so I'm like, yeah, we get all these sexy ideas because these guys have these great accents. But then I'm like, oh, that poor narrator. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I feel bad that that author just threw that in there and expect that, you know, not saying you guys can't do it. It's just when there's a whole gazillion of those different accents in there, I, I kind of feel bad. But then I feel good because I know that you guys are going to rock it and I'm going to enjoy listening to it. So that's good. Well, I just remember. It was Scottish. The team <laughs> captain is Scottish. <laughs> I swear to you. Honestly, I think she just thought, she was like, what are the sexiest accents exactly. out there? Went, okay, I love Swedish. Scottish is super sexy. Cajun, like how that sounds. And Texan, yes. And I was just like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I can just imagine people's faces when they're like, yeah. And then, of course, we expect, you know, we want Pippa to rock it. So Pippa better bring all six of those. <laughs> Pippa is sweating it. Every time Pippa's at the gym these days, she's got accent tapes in her head. <laughs> she's like doing Stairmaster to Cajun. Repeat after me. And I'm like, I'm I'm at the gym. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's hilarious. But you know what is so funny is that um, I did not used to think, and, and it's probably just our my stupidity, is that you guys have to do so much in preparation 
for um, and for production. It's, you know, just as much work as the author who has to write it and it goes through proofing and beta readers and editing and re-editing and, and the cover and all of that. And then it goes to the narrator who then has to um, so, uh, suppose what read it and skim through it and make notes and and um, yeah. come up with these ideas about what the person's going to sound like and understand what dialect it's going to be from and there is a lot of prep work and then you have listeners like me who are kind of harassing the narrator and the author like when is this book going to come out? <laughs> can you hurry up <laughs> but we don't really sometimes we just miss that and don't take into account that there's a lot of prep that goes into it because if it's not good of course you're going to hear that but you know we want it's your name and it's the author's name and of course you want it to be you know as close to perfect as possible so what's yeah. kind of what's kind of your routine to get yourself prepped for something that's similar to that or where there's a lot of characters and you have to make sure that you give each character their own voice. Well, for example, for, um, for this, uh, for this book, um, that I'm doing now, the hockey romance, um, I, I am listening to accent tapes every day because Cajun is not, um, an easy, did you know, <laughs> I didn't know this. This is I so interesting. Didn't know. I'm going to tell you in advance. I don't know. <laughs> well, I didn't know either. So I always assumed that the French, right, that the French influence in Louisiana came from France. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, um, that may have been so, but for the Cajun, for the Cajun dialect, the French they reference comes from Nova Scotia. So it comes via Canada and it's, it's very different from the Creole mm -hmm. uh, accented French. So for example, for this book, I just listened to a lot of tapes and I realized that the accent sounds so, um, it doesn't sound like it's not a, a melodic accent. It's not soft and easy, like Southern, like, Hey y'all, you know, there's nothing, yeah. um, easy to r relax into. So I just picked, what I do then is I just pick a few hallmark sounds. I pick a few sounds that keep recurring in the accent and I just try to bring those in. Mm -hmm. And that can take days sometimes to really whittle it down and find something that works for the book, works for the narration. And then for the other ones, um, Scottish and Swedish, I just listen. I listen for a couple of sounds that I know will work because and I do know narrators that are absolutely religious. They will learn the whole accent to perform the book. Mm -hmm. I am one of those narrators who I want to tell the story and I want to give people a, like a flavor of the accent. And if I can do the whole accent, you know, people hire me for my German all the time. Not all the time, but I've done quite a few books because I speak German fluently. Um, so I get books for, to, with a lot of German words or German accented characters. And that one, you know, they expect me to be a hundred percent. It's a hundred percent, but most accents, if I'm, if I'm not a hundred percent in the accent, I'll evoke the accent. And that's a discussion that some narrators will be, you know, completely on the other end of the, um, the discussion about that. And they will poo poo that and find that appalling. <laughs> But I want to tell the story and I'd rather, I don't know, I always feel like it's my job to disappear. Like if my, the biggest compliment I can ever get as a narrator is I forgot it was you. I didn't even hear you. I was in the story mm -hmm. and that's what I'm working for. So, so yes, I listened to all the accent tapes for the floating world because it was set in New Orleans, New Orleans. I, I contacted a dear friend of mine who was born and raised there, and I asked her to narrate certain um, parts of dialogue, and I also asked her to give me all the place names. <clears throat> so I sent her the manuscript, and I highlighted every single street name and every single um, local word that we don't use here in California, for example, or in New York, where I was born, and so that I would have the correct pronunciation. So, you know, it would sound like 
because that, that takes people out of the book. If you're not from there, you wouldn't know. But if you're from there and you're listening to this book and you have been through Katrina, the last thing you need is some ill-prepared narrator, you know, saying the names of your streets and your hometown wrong. Yeah. So we all avoid that. I mean, all narrators do that kind of work. You know, we uh, prepare local names and stuff like that so that we're saying them the way they're they meant to be said. And if we get it wrong, then that's not because we didn't try super hard. You know, it's because something got by me or something got by the proofer or, but so yeah, we put in, we invest time. We really do. Yeah. You, I, we can tell, we can tell uh, you invest that time in and we appreciate it. But so we're going to take a listen to the sample of the floating world. And who's the author again, Krista? This, um, the floating world was written by C Morgan Bapst. And this is literally the very beginning of the book. Um, and she jumps around in the timeline. So you start the book after Katrina has hit, after landfall. But then during the course of the book, as the story unfolds, you go back to landfall and then briefly during the evacuation time. So what we're going to be listening to is uh, about two and a half minutes of literally the beginning of the book. All right. Well, here we are, everybody. A quick sample of The Floating World performed by Krista Lewis. Each must be his own hope. Virgil, The Aeneid, Book 11. 47 days after landfall, October 15th. Troy's bloated house reeked of flood. Dirt, mildew, algae, the smell of the dead. On the dusty siding, she traced the line of sediment that circled the house, high up where the water had come. Beside the door was the mark of the storm. Nine six zero one D TF three. The broken concrete of the driveway seesawed and the kitchen window was still open as she and Troy had left it when they came for the children. The shutters banged flat against the weatherboard. The little boy had jumped at her from the window sill, naked except for a pair of water wings, a frenzy of brown and orange. She closed her eyes. Blot it out. But even in the dark, she could feel his head cupped in her hand. She could hear Raina screaming. She saw herself rocking in the pirogue in the thick air. The little boy nestled against her chest. The flood had floated them high. Now she got up and put one foot against the siding, two hands on the sill. She strained, scrambled, jumped. She hauled her body up and perched in the window, her muscles trembling. The moon cast Cora's shadow, long and black, across the kitchen floor where a woman lay, her face no longer a face, only a mess of blackened blood. She shut her eyes, blot it out. But when she looked again, Raina's body still lay curled, as if in sleep, around the shotgun that was missing from the house on Esplanade, her arm trailing awkwardly behind her, like something ripped apart by a strong wind. Blot it out, Mrs. Ransell had told her. So she had been sleeping. Drugs like a dark river to drown in. But now she felt again the gun recoil against her shoulder. Saw again the light of the blast in the high hall. Blot it out. But she could see, as clear as if it were happening again in front of her now, Troy standing above her at the top of the stairs, the little boy reaching out to stroke his mother's smooth, unmaddened brow. She saw Raina press her face against the window. Her eyes plucked out by birds. Cora looked down from the window, and the pool of blood whirled through the woman's face, through the kitchen floor, pulling her under. The storm threw a barge against the flood wall. The surge dug out handfuls of sand. The gulf bent its head and rammed into the breach until it had tunneled through to air. The lowest pressure ever recorded, the radio voices said, and the vacuum pulled at her her nightdress snapping against her body like a flag. Night poured in through the window. Stars streaked down through the sky. 
she would fall. She was falling. The flood's reek rose. Wow, I remember um, when Katrina hit, and I think that uh, pretty much everybody remembers when that uh, that tragedy and that disaster happened, and just listening to that um, that clip brings back a lot of memories. And like you mentioned um, earlier, Harvey, because it's that's just something recent, and so now it's you know kind of reliving that entire situation. Um, of somebody going through that tragedy and that hopelessness and what, you know, and, and so when you narrate this book or when you perform this book or books that's um, similar to that in mood, how do you, how do you recover? I mean, how do you get yourself back to a state where you're not in that moment or you're not, uh, I guess, um, um, taking on those emotions of what you've performed in that book? How do you find that balance back to, I guess, your happy, perky self? I don't know. Does that affect you? Or when you were performing that, how were you affected by that? I think um, ask any narrator, and they're going to have a different answer to this because I think some narrators work from the inside out when they develop characters vocally or psychologically. Some work from the outside in. Um, I feel it really strongly. And um, I, but I need those emotions to bring the author's world to, to bring the truth of it. Right. Because it's, I see these words, but it's, the author is also writing about something deeper. You know what I mean? There's always nuance and several levels. So I try to access and stay open to those emotions so that I have them. And to get back to my happy place, sometimes you just don't actually. Um, The floating world and the gypsy moth summer, um, both of those were painful in two different ways. And it's appropriate that they're painful. You know, I mean, there, there's always somewhere in there, you know, the journey of the hero or the heroine in this case in the floating world, um, where they get to, you know, where they start out, what happens to them and where they arrive at. I, I try to find redemption if they're finding redemption, but Mm -hmm. that's, it's really not my job. My job is to convey all the different threads and the emotional um, nuance that the author is evoking with their words. So, and with Ravensbrück, um, I was ill. I was literally ill because um, that was horrific. What happened to those people, you know, World War II was horrific in any case and all the specificity and all the details. It was, there were moments where I, I just couldn't wrap my brain around it. And I would go to bed and I'd sleep for 14 hours because, and I couldn't narrate very much at a, at one go because it was, it was just too much. So I'm literally still recovering from that book, even though I did that like months ago, I, I can't, I couldn't process it really. I couldn't process it very well. And you know what? There's some part of bearing witness that, I think I agree with, you know, just being there for somebody or it's like being with a good friend, do you know, and they're going through something really super hard. Right. And then maybe it's like that. Maybe that's the best way to describe it in that moment. Do I, you know, who cares if I'm happy, <laughs> they're going through something super hard and it's, I'm just going to try and be there for them. And What I noticed was going to the gym, actually. So that's, I guess that's the long way around to the answer is um, going to the gym, listening to some music, taking myself out of the story, right? I have the luxury that I'm not stuck in the flood. So I can go to the gym and listen to some music. And there's a little guilt, I think, associated with that because I know I have it good. You know, I have this privileged position, but that's how I do it. Because obviously, if you stay in there too long, you're just going to go crazy and you need to have kind of a fresh slate or a clean slate uh, for the next story 
to do that one justice. Yeah. So I think, I think moving, moving music, um, talking to friends, having a laugh, you know, normal stuff, how we all kind of rebalance in our lives. Yeah. But when it's really super hard, um, then time, really just time. Yeah. yeah, I totally get it. And and for me, listening to books that are really emotional afterwards, it's a recovery. It's a recovery period. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and usually um, I have to go and listen to something really, really funny or yeah. something that's really I have to watch one of those stupid movies that just mean that just are so far fetched that you just say this is the stupidest movie ever. But then <laughs> it kind of like give you that balance back um yeah a little bit pixar things, disney yeah. or pixar <laughs> yeah. perfect I, disney Indian. is my favorite right. so of course maybe i'll watch tangled or something like that and, right. um and, and that always helps um but i think also i i was gonna write a blog about because i never like to listen to or read books that make you ugly cry it's just i don't know i don't like to cry um like that but I also think it's important too because sometimes you may have emotions that you really need to deal with but you've suppressed them so much and being able to listen to another story can kind of help you get out what you've been holding in and so it, it kind of like that dam overflows and, and then everything is out there and then you kind of can put yourself back together and that's when I kind of go into my rom-coms or you know watching you know Austin Powers because I like Austin Powers it's pretty funny and uh, <laughs> and those type of things and um and so uh and and I I appreciate when a narrator is moved by the story because you can really tell that emotion that they put into you can feel it you can't fake perform that I don't think um, and, and you guys do a really good job with that. So, um, everybody, the floating world is, is, is it released already? Absolutely. Well, we'll be looking forward to, um, adding that book to our collection and also adding a few of these others. We'll be watching you to see what's coming next. And now here's the main question that I ask everybody. All right. So, first of all, tell me about your home studio. What's it like in there? What are you hiding in there? What are some of the things that are must? I see your cat because I'm looking at the the um the video and the cat popped up back there and is hanging out with mama and um does the cat ever get to go in, in the booth? Um I have two cats. That one's Pi and there's Tesla. And um Pi likes to go into the booth and scratch all the foam in the oh, booth. No. So Pi is not allowed in the booth anymore <laughs> because <laughs> Pi just climbs the walls and scratches up all the foam and I'm like, No, oh, no, God. no. He thinks it's he thinks it's his, like his scratch pad. That's, That's right. Hilarious. And Tesla comes into the booth and all he wants to do in this lifetime is to sleep in the booth while mommy works. Oh. Because he's so delighted that he actually gets to sleep in the booth while mommy is working, he snores really loud. So, and purrs. So I've got this snore purr, purr snore, snore purr. And finally I'm like, Tesla, you're out of the booth now because I can't work. You know? <laughs> so I'm just so doing this audio book and all of a sudden you hear <laughs> on like high speed because he's so delighted so no they not allowed in the booth and oh my um, gosh, that's yeah funny. it's really just sad and so they they jump up on the kitchen table and it's a glass door to the booth and so mm -hmm. they just stare at me and make me feel guilty so yeah. <laughs> oh they're like we want to be in there with you mom it's but you got one who thinks the booth is his scratch pad and the other one just goes in there like that's his bedroom and he snores oh. and stuff so that, yeah, yeah, that's always fun. How did you come up with their names, Pi and Tesla? I don't know. I tried. I got they were brothers and they were so tiny. And I tried everything. I tried Calvin and Hobbes. I tried, I don't know, you know, Pooh and Piglet. I tried every combination, whiskers and boots. And it just, I tried for like four or five days. I had these two cute little kittens with me. And finally, I just... I don't know. I guess I've always had this obsession with um, Tesla, the electrician or the, you know, this genius mm -hmm. in the 19th century, the 20th, 20th century, 19th century genius. And, um, and then I just went, Tesla 
And the other one, he's all black with these big electric yellow eyes. And he looked right at me and I went, oh, oh, and because his hair, his long black hair, the other one's short hair. I don't know how they came from the same mother. And his hair, though, was it was stood up. It was like you had rubbed a balloon. So his hair was always like electrified. So I was like, OK, so maybe you're Tesla. But if you're Tesla, what's the other one? And so nothing worked with Tesla except pie. And I was just like, all right. And my other cat, the cat in Berlin, was Einstein. So, ah, yeah. Oh. So, I don't know. That's just where my brain goes. I mean, I am not a math whiz. I totally failed at math. But Tesla and Pi, that's how they got that. And obviously now they need to be like cuddles, whiskers, boots, mittens, kittens, whatever. But it's too late. <laughs> that's what they are. They're Pi and Tesla. I love it. That's so cute. So, we, we know how your cats got their names. So, tell us. <laughs> Tell us how how um, Pippa Jane came into being. What's the story behind that? Well, my um, I was my very first foray into um, erotica, spicy romance, and at the time I didn't know. I was a little embarrassed, I guess, and so I was trying to think of a name that was cute and snarky and kind of you know ha ha ha, and it just wasn't working. I sent my first attempt. I thought PJ, like pajamas, PJ. <laughs> I think, you know, I thought, okay, PJ, that's great. That's like pajamas. That's funny. And then I had PJ Cummings. I thought that uh-huh. was hilarious. I thought I was just a genius. And I sent it to my author and she was like, yeah. <laughs> really? Oh. And then I thought, oh, that was, she did not love that. So I went back and I, and I, it just had to be me, though, because it's not like I'm ashamed of the books. I stand by my books. I just wanted to separate the genres so that, you know, right. teenagers don't Google me and come up with this really spicy, steamy stuff and all that stuff. So I was like, well, my nickname when I was a kid was Pippi for Pippi Longstocking. I had long braids and my mother called me Pippi and my sister was Pooh for Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, German moms. Oh my gosh. So I was Pippi and so I'm like Pee, Pippi, 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 Pippa. Pippa, I like Pippa. And then because I had the J from pajamas, I was like, Pippa. and I always love that show. You know, The Mentalist? I don't know. I'm yes. so corny. Yeah. Jane, right? So I was like, Pippa Jane. So that's how I got my pseudonym. <laughs> I love hearing stories about how people come up with those with the um, with the pseudonyms because it's never something that you would have guessed. And right. so I and, and it's fun. I think it's really fun. But the question that I always ask, and especially with authors too, is okay, you write under a different name. So yeah. how do you you know, somebody's calling you. It's like, do you program yourself to know that, hey, I have two names. And if somebody calls me this, even though I know my given name is not that, that I will respond and not ignore them mm-hmm. because that's really right. my name. And that's always my thing is I want to just go around and start calling people by their their pen names and their pseudonyms and seeing how quick they respond. Because I'm always thinking, you know, that's not your real name. So how do you just turn that on. But for you, it's, is it a little easier because it's similar to your nickname? Yeah. And also because I don't, you know, I don't walk out into the street as Pippa Jane, or Mm -hmm. if I go to a networking conference, um, I go just as myself. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I don't, I, I tell people, you know, and I tell clients so that they can, you know, cast me or, you know, they say, Oh, they, they'll write to me. This is a book for Pippa. But for me, it's, I think for authors, it's different because they create these whole fan bases, right, yeah. on on this pseudonym. And so they go as that name. The author of um, the whole Brie series, um, that's her name in public. You know, nobody, that's it. She is Red Phoenix. And yeah. she also calls herself that. So, you know, now I call her that too. So I think they have to, they create a really strong persona and they're just used to it and they just turn it on and they're just there. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I think the more that you, like it's the more that you're using that, you you become that person, that's your brand. And so it's easier for you to yeah. recognize that's my brand. That's, you know, what yeah. I, that's who I am. And so, but I think it's fun. However, 
I'm going to see if I come up with a pseudonym, what it would be. And <laughs> so I'm just going to, I'm going to try test some things out on my Facebook page and see how that, how that works out for me. So you just stay tuned to see. I will. It'll be fun. <laughs> It will be because you'll be like, I'm friends with this person. Who the heck is that? that? <laughs> That's always the fun part. Well, we are excited. We thank you so much for being on the Feature Voice. And we want to make sure that everybody knows where and how to find you um, on social media, especially if there are any authors who are listening and looking for um, a fresh voice for any of their audiobooks. I did forget to ask you, are there any um, book genres that you haven't? narrated yet that you would love to do? Um, to be honest, I would love to do children's books. I, I would be absolutely delighted to do children's books, but I've been pretty lucky. I've, I have, I've done mystery, YA, romance, literary fiction, um, thrillers, suspense. So uh, slowly but surely, I'm kind of covering all the bases, but mm -hmm. a children's books. Oh, <laughs> and um, once I sent Marty that um, audition, she promised me she would write a series for me. So I'm still waiting for the elf ladies. And I, I don't even know what the series is called, but one day my dream will come true and I'll get to do a children's book. But other than that, I'm pretty much happy to just narrate, you know, whatever comes my way so far. It's always been really interesting and really great. Well, that's good. You know, you can always write your own book too. If you just, <laughs> if you just, you know, while you're waiting, you know, you can, you can right? This you will can, be great. I'll throw in should, a million accents. <laughs> or you can do it, and you can call it Tes the Adventures of Tesla and Pie. There you go. Uh -huh. You should write it. <laughs> You should write it. I'm always good with giving people ideas, but you know, uh -huh. putting it into action, that's really not my thing. <laughs> you know, I can totally relate to that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you feel me? You feel me? So, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, tell everybody how they can find you on social media. So, on Twitter, I'm at Liquid Bells. Liquid, B-E-L-L-E-S. On Twitter, I'm at Liquid Bells. And on Facebook, I'm Krista G. Lewis, L-E-W-I-S. And um, on Instagram, which I have, I've been neglecting, I'm also at Liquid Bells. And, and my audiobook website is KristaLewisAudiobooks.com. And um, you can hear samples and see an interview and get the bio and all that stuff. And, uh, yeah, and that's how I'm reachable on social media. All right. So everybody, you heard it here. Be sure that you are following Krista on Twitter and, uh, go on Instagram and find her and, and share a picture. <laughs> we'll see cat pic pictures. You'll see pie in the booth. <laughs> yes. And make sure that you let her know that she has an Instagram account that she's been neglecting. I'm looking at Thank you. <laughs> I'm looking at Pi right now, like standing on your laptop, just like he's getting ready to narrate a book or something. But see, this is what I'm saying. He's really telling you to write the children's story about him. I'm just saying. I think that would be kind of cool. Um, but yeah. So, oh, last question, Krista. You're in yes. your home booth. What are you wearing? What do you wear? I wear um, a great big loose T-shirt. Um, I tend to <laughs> wear the ugliest bras known to humanity, <laughs> right? They give you absolutely no shape, no nothing. But they just, you know, so I don't knock myself out when I walk out of the booth. But... <laughs> They're super loose and comfortable so I can breathe. And I either wear uh, gym clothes, you know, sweatpants or um, uh, jeans. or But I have to unzip them and unbutton them because you just need to breathe when you're in the boots. <laughs> yeah, really ugly bras, a T-shirt, and 
something down below because you get so hot in there sometimes. You really do not want to be sticking to the chair. <laughs> don't want to be sticking to the chair. So no. every the, the whole running joke is that most narrators don't wear pants in the booth. So I wear just, pants in the booth. You wear it all the time? Yes, because otherwise there's just... Sometimes it's just too perspiring and you know how that is. You're sitting on this chair and your cheeks are sticking to it and you're like, oh no, you know, it's already hard enough. Why suffer more? <laughs> yeah, I can, I can imagine that would be a little uncomfortable with the sweaty cheeks on the chair, it is. trying it to is. peel yourself off yeah. and. Oh, ugly, <laughs> ugly. It sounds ugly and it feels worse. <laughs> oh, gosh, that made my face hurt. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so we know what she's wearing in the booth. So we're we're happy that um, that you can you can keep some sort of clothes on, but you're buttoning the jeans because you need to breathe and you're wearing the ugly bra. So that's that's the new hashtag, the ugly bras. The ugly no, bra. In the booth. The ugliest the bra. The ugliest bras. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'm going to see where you can find those at. They've got to be interesting to look at. Oh, they're so, like a Bed Bath & Beyond for $9.99, and they're made out of bamboo or hemp. <laughs> oh, God. It's like you want to... You want to burn the bra or smoke it or something. That's it. Roll that one up and smoke it. Yeah, like after we wear these in the booth, we roll it up and smoke it. <laughs> after it airs out because it's got sweat, you know. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah, my face hurts now. Okay. <laughs> so right. good. Achievement unlocked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of uh, The Featured Voice. Thank you for joining us for the entire second season of The Featured Voice. You can follow us on Facebook at The Audio Flow and also find us on Twitter at The underscore audio underscore flow and also on Instagram at The Audio Flow. You can hear all episodes of The Featured Voice on iHeartRadio and TuneIn. It is also downloadable on iTunes and Google Play and you can also check us out on YouTube. Thanks to my producer, Danielle, at Firefly Productions and also my assistant, Rebecca. Until next time, everyone, thanks for joining us. Thank you again, Krista, for being here. And we will talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us for Season 2 of The Featured Voice. Be sure to join us for Season 3 beginning November 27th as we introduce more narrators in the audiobook industry, including Aaron Shedlock, Troy Duran, TJ Richards, Pam Doherty, Lacey Laurel, and Tor Tom. Until next time, remember, audiobooks should be love at first sound.